Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's start off with number 587. 587. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, pray. thanks for the day that you have given us this day to be here in your house of worship to gather with Christians to proclaim your word to praise your name and to fellowship with one another we thank you for the avenue that we have to approach 
you through prayer and and approach you through prayer on our behalf and on the behalf of others and as a congregation on those that gather around us as family and friends that we can uh, be part of of their lives uh, through our prayers to you. We thank you that you touch each of these uh, families and each of these people and for your healing hands that uh, have been uh, demonstrated uh, in uh, the lives of those that uh, we've mentioned earlier and we know that you're with those who have suffered uh, greatly in heartbreak and it's only you can uh, be the comfort that they're needed and that you will send those that surround and love them and hold them up in these times of difficulties. We thank you that uh, we have uh, the strength of each other as we gather at this place here in Callisburg at this time uh, to uh, worship you, but also as the community of believers here that our light at this place will shine brightly in this community that their word will be known and that we will be known uh, as Christians here uh, that celebrate uh, the life we have, the salvation we have in Christ. Continue with us as this service can, goes forth. Touch men as he delivers your message with us today. We pray these things through Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining apart through shadows dim, giving a light for those who long have gone, and guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine Savior, so pure and free from 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you've blessed us with, Lord, that we could come together to gather around this table, Lord, to reflect back on Christ, his life, and the cross, Lord. We're so thankful for Christ and his willingness to go to that cross, to suffer, to bleed, and to die, Lord, for, for our sins, Lord. And we're so thankful for the greatest sacrifice that was ever given. Lord, we ask that you be with us as we take this, as we have a clear mind, and we reflect back to that cross and that sacrifice and that we partake of this bread which represents Christ's body in a way that's pleasing to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we continue our thanks, our thanks for for sending your Son to this to this earth and to live the perfect life, but yet be willing to go to the cross to take on the sins of the world, Lord. We just pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood that was shed on that cross of Calvary, we just pray that we will examine our hearts, Lord, and that we will partake in a manner will please to you, and that we will focus totally on the cross and the sacrifice, the pain, the suffering that Jesus went through on our behalf. In Christ's name. Lord, we thank you so much for all the many blessings that we received. We thank you for this chance we have of coming together and studying another portion of thy will, taking of these emblems. Lord, we pray that we now think back to all the blessings that we received and give accordingly back to you as our heart tells us. May this things be done according to thy will. Christ and we pray. Amen. 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 I'll stand and sing number 280. 280. When peace like a
invitation will be number 721. 721. Our scripture reader this morning is right or read. Today's scripture reading comes from Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Brother Ben. <clears throat> well, good morning. It is good to see everybody here, good to have our visitors with us. Church, we are happy to see all of you, and we are glad to have you, and uh, especially Bobby Westbrook sitting back there on the back pew. We are so glad to see him here this morning. He has, uh, he's been through a lot of struggles, and uh, I'm telling you what, if you don't believe in the power of prayer, take a look back there on the back pew, because he is looking pretty good, and we are glad to have you him here with us this morning. I told him when I saw him, I said, Bobby, you are looking significantly better than you looked the last time I saw you when he was laying in that hospital bed. And we are, we're happy that he's here and glad that everything is working out for them. We've had a number of, uh, of people in our congregation that we have seen uh, the power of prayer on, and we always want to be thankful for those. But we are glad that everybody's here this morning, and uh, we hope that we can encourage any visitors that are here to come back and see us again in the future. So yesterday... I spent about nine hours with this bunch right here, these six right here. I spent. You haven't lived your life until you spend about eight or nine hours with this group right here because I'll tell you, they're an interesting group of young people to be with. We went down to, to Fort Worth yesterday and we went to the main event, which is a... Uh, it, it's a big arcade room. They have a little zip line thing and some rope climbing. They have laser tag. They have bowling. They have pool. We spent the whole afternoon down there, and I got to learn a lot about these six kids while we were down there yesterday afternoon. And most of it, I'm not going to repeat from the pulpit up here. <laughs> no, they are. I got to tell you. I, I have to tell you. This is the finest group of young people. It, it was a blast. We had a lot of fun, but I did learn a lot about them. I learned that. Uh, I learned that Braden is a better pool player than I am. I learned that Ryder is a better bowler than I am. Um, I learned that Junior is a better race car driver than I am. Are you getting a trend here? These guys are better than me. I, I learned that I'm getting really, really old. I learned that. And then, uh, let me think, who else have we got up there? Oh, well, you know, Jonah. Jonah is an amazing individual because we're down there in this arcade where there are literally hundreds of people just running around, coming and going. It is noisy. There's buzzers going off. There's bells going off. There's whistles going off. Everybody's playing their machines. There's a bowling alley there. You know how loud bowling alleys are? It's just, it, it, it's organized chaos, really. And in the middle of it, and I wish I'd have got a picture of this because I'd have put it up there. In the middle of it, they had a table that was sitting right in the middle of the arcade with a stool next to it. And Jonah sat at that table and read his book without ever missing a word or a page in that book. And I thought, how in the world can that kid do that? He never looked up. He just sat right there, and the whole world was ripping right past him. So, yeah, I learned from Jonah, if you put your mind to it, you can really concentrate on whatever you want to be doing at that particular time. So, and then, you know, the girls, I learned from them that uh, when you're, you know, 16 years old and you're a girl, I guess you can memorize every single word to every girly song that comes on the radio, even words that I can't even understand what they're saying. They were back there bopping them off. So, But we had a lot of fun. If you've ever been to a place like that, the arcade, the way that it works is that the arcade, you go in there and you buy a game card. And these little game cards are just like a credit card. You purchase those, you, you put as much money on them as you want. And then when you go to play the arcade games, you don't actually put money in the arcade game. Just like a credit card machine, they've got a little swipe thing on there. And you go to the game, you swipe your card, and it gives you the credits on the game, and then you play the game. And you go throughout until you run out on your card. Then you can go back and put more money on your card. It's a great invention because as long as you're carrying this little piece of plastic around, you really don't know how much money you're spending, right? Until <laughs> you go through all those games. But Junior and I were playing a basketball game, and we got over there next to each other, and I was on one little court, and he was on the other. 
And it, the idea is to shoot as many baskets, hit as many baskets as you can in 90 seconds. And I swiped the card on his, swiped the card on mine, rolled the basketballs down there, and we started shooting. 90 seconds later, we had done pretty good. And I said, man, we tore that up. Let's do it again. And we swiped it again. We did it again. And I said, that, we, we're, we're trucking here, man. We're making points. We're doing good. We're doing good. But we can do better. We can do better. And we swiped it. We played it again. We played it three or four times. Then the last time I said, I know we can do better. I know we can do better. We're going to do it again. We're going to start again. And I swiped his and swiped mine. We stood there and no basketballs came out. And I said, what's going on here? Junior looked down there and he said, man, you're out of money. <laughs> and I said, but I want to start over. I want to do it again. So I had to go put more money on my card so that I could start over and do it again. But the great thing about those arcade games and stuff, that's why they're so addicting, is because when you do something, you always think, I could do that a little bit better. And I want to try again. And I'm going to start over. And let me hit the reset button and go back and try again. Because I did good that time, but I know I can do a little bit better. How many of us have ever lived our lives feeling a lot that way? That if we could... There are things in our lives that we would just like to hit the reset button on. That we'd just like to go back and be able to start over again. That if I had an endless little card that when I messed up, when I made a mistake, when I fell short, I could just take that little card and I could swipe it in there and push the start button and all of the scores clear and everything goes back to zero and I can start all over again. Because folks, the fact is all of us in our lives, we, we make mistakes and we mess up, and we fall short, and we do things wrong, and all of us at one point or another have probably said, how did I get where I'm at? And if I had the chance, I wish I could just push the reset button and start all over again. Well, we're going to look at a story this morning over in the book of Matthew. If you've got your Bibles with you, open them up over to Matthew, the ninth chapter. We're going to start there here in just a second. And we're going to look at another story this morning of another apostle that's being called. If you remember last Sunday, we looked at the story of Peter and James and John and Andrew, and when Jesus called them to follow him, the four fishermen that were there at the Sea of Galilee cleaning their nets when Jesus showed up, and, and he took them out, and they caught this great catch of fish, and he said, from now on, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're going to come and follow me. Well, this morning, we're going to look at another one of his followers that he calls. This guy's not a fisherman. He doesn't have much to do with the sea. He lives close by, but he's not a fisherman and doesn't work there. He has an entirely different occupation. Look with me over here in Matthew chapter 9, starting in the ninth verse. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 9. It says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he said. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but it is the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners." You know, this is a fantastic passage of Scripture. Here we have Jesus calling another one of His, another one of His twelve that He's going to have follow Him very closely, right side by side. They live with Him for the next three years. And as He's walking down the road, He sees this man. It's Matthew. And Matthew is a tax collector, and he's basically in his office. He's sitting in his tax collection booth where he collected the taxes from the people. And as Jesus walks by and sees Matthew there, He says, Come follow me. And Matthew gets up. And he goes and follows Jesus. And not only does he follow Jesus, but, but he takes Jesus to his house. And he fixes him a big dinner. And all of these people come to this big dinner. Jesus is there, and his followers are there, and Matthew's there, and Matthew's friends are there. And on the peripheral, there's the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders. They're there. Everybody's at this dinner. And the Pharisees take a look at Jesus in eating this dinner at Matthew's house. And they say to his disciples, why is it that Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners? Why does he do that? Now he asks the disciples, but Jesus gives the answer. And Jesus comes back and says, listen, it's not the well that need a doctor. It's the sick that need a doctor. I haven't, been come, to call, I haven't come to call the righteous. I have come to call sinners. 
I have come to call those who wish to have a start over. I've come to call those who are wishing there was just a reset button on my life where I could start things over because I know that there's something missing in my life. And Matthew is one of those people. Now Matthew, we think about Matthew as being the apostle, and we look, he's, he's the one that wrote the letter, the book that we just now read out of, the book of Matthew. Matthew, when you look at it from the outside, it probably appears that Matthew's doing pretty good. That things are going all right for Matthew. He's got a business. He's financially pretty well off, apparently, if you look at the story. He's well off enough that he's taken Jesus to his house. The house is large enough that he can have this large dinner. He's taken care of what it takes to purchase everything for the dinner and to entertain all of these people that have come. So Matthew's doing pretty good. He's a tax collector. He's making money. He owns property. He's got a little bit of wealth. He's got people that come out and hang out with him. And on, on the outside, it looks like, looks like Matthew's doing pretty good. But you know what's going on with Matthew? What's going on with Matthew is that Matthew, while it may look like everything's going great for him on the outside, he's got a good job, he's got good money, he's got a good house, he can afford to throw parties for his friends. Oh, to be like Matthew. But on the inside, there's something missing with Matthew. And Jesus knows that. And Jesus knows that this is a guy that I'm going to put to use in my service. And while Matthew is sitting in his tax collector's booth, while he's basically sitting in his office working that day, Jesus comes along and he says, you come follow me. And you notice how fast Matthew does it. He jumps right up and leaves and he goes and follows Jesus. And somewhere in there, he tells Jesus, come to my house. Let me fix you dinner. I'll have some friends come over. I know people that would like to meet you. So you look at the outside and you think, well, Matthew's pretty much got it going on, but there is something missing on the inside. And, and the first lesson that we can learn from the calling of Matthew this morning is the fact that, folks, no matter how much you have in this life, no matter how much you have in this world, no matter how rich you are, no matter how much property you have, no matter how many friends you have, if you don't have God in your life, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you really don't have anything. Matthew has a job. Matthew's got money. Matthew's got people that will come over to his house. Matthew can afford to feed all of these people. He can afford to do all of these things. But Matthew knows there is something missing. Even with everything that I can gather up and everything that I have in this life and everything that on the outside it looks like I'm doing okay, there is just something missing. And ladies and gentlemen, this world is filled with people who are trying to fill their lives with the things of this life. They're trying to fulfill their lives by filling their bank accounts. They're trying to fulfill their lives by getting the next promotion. They're trying to fulfill their lives by having more stuff. They're trying to fulfill their lives by getting one step further in this life and in this world. But folks, if we don't have Jesus in this life, in our life, it doesn't matter what else we have. We really don't have anything. If we don't have a solid basis with God, then it doesn't matter what, we're, what we accumulate and what we have here because we really don't have anything. And you know, one of the most famous people in the Bible, King Solomon, understood that very well. King Solomon, who was King David's son, who takes the throne of Israel after his father, who the Lord tells Solomon, God tells Solomon, what would you like? What can I give you? Whatever you want, I will give you. And Solomon says, give me wisdom to guide these people right. And God was so impressed with him that God gave him that wisdom, and he gave him great wealth. And there comes a point in Solomon's life, and we have read sections of this letter many times back in the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes. There comes a time in King Solomon's life when he starts looking at all the stuff. And King Solomon starts taking an inventory of what his life is all about. And he's got quite a list to take an inventory from. I remember when I worked with General Electric, we had to do a physical, they called it a physical inventory every year. We had 750,000 square feet of warehouse space, literally millions of items, and we had to count each individual item once a year. Physical inventory. We'd go through to see what we had. It took us a whole week. We'd have to shut down for a whole week. 
all hands on deck, just count. Here in the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon's taking an inventory. He's sitting down and he's saying, I've got all this stuff in my life. And if you look over in Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, he says, starting in the fourth verse, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs for water to, to water the flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had other slaves who were born into my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing that my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. King Solomon, the entire book of Ecclesiastes is King Solomon taking an inventory of his life. And he's saying, nobody ruled like I did. His father's part of that. He said, nobody's ruled like I have. Nobody's been as powerful as I have. He's saying, I'm, you know, when it comes right down to it, I'm greater than David was. Nobody's amassed the amount of wealth that I have. I've got gold, and I've got silver, and I've got chariots, and I've got livestock. And just for fun, I would purchase more property, and I would build groves, and I would plant trees, and I would do all the work on, on making sure everything was watered properly, and everything looked great, and I had palaces. And I had men and women singers. I had a harem. And you notice how he puts that in there? He said, nothing that my eyes desired did I turn myself down with. The desires of man. Everything that I wanted, I had. And then he says, and then when I look back at it, I think it's all been meaningless. A chasing in the wind. He says, I know that what's taking place here is all of this stuff that I've gathered up, all of this stuff that I can have here, and everything that I can be here is eventually just going to disappear. And there has to be more. And Solomon goes through the entire book of Ecclesiastes wondering about this and taking this inventory and talking about all that he's gathered up. And at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes in the 12th chapter, what King Solomon does is he says, here's the conclusion of the matter. He says, after I've thought about it, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for that is the whole duty of man. You know what, Matthew had all of this stuff on the outside, but Matthew was missing something on the inside. And the first lesson that we can learn from the calling of Matthew is the fact that Folks, no matter how much we have here, if we don't have Jesus, we have nothing. And then a second lesson that we can learn from the story of Matthew is the fact that Jesus always sees potential in us. He knows what we are capable of and He knows what we can do. Now I want you to think about Matthew, and I know that we've talked about tax collectors in here before. I know we've talked about their reputation and who they were, and, and in case you hadn't been a part of that, let me give you a quick rundown real fast. Tax collectors in ancient Judea were on the bottom of the list as far as likable people went. Nobody liked the tax collectors in ancient Judea. And there is a very good reason for that. They were, overwhelmingly, Jewish men. They were all working for the Roman government. The Roman government was an invading force. They were an occupying army. The people of Judea did not invite Rome to come stay there. They didn't say, Caesar, we would love to have all of your armies come and camp out in Jerusalem. No, Caesar marched on Judea and took it over forcefully. And now these Jewish men go to work for the Roman government. They're basically, as far as the rest of the Jews are concerned, traitors. Because when the Roman government took over, they came in and they said, now we're going to tax everybody. You've got to pay taxes back to Rome. And we need people to collect those taxes. We got any volunteers? And there you can always find somebody to lose something for money. And these Jewish guys say, you know, Matthew's one of them. I volunteer. I'll do it. 
So Matthew's a tax collector working for an occupying force. He's basically a traitor to all the rest of the Jews. And then on top of that, historically, tax collectors in Judea were crooked. They took more money than they had to. The Romans had a system down where they would tell the tax collectors, you take, you know, 8%. Anything above and beyond that, we don't care. Do whatever you want to do. And the tax collectors were notorious for that. You know, every time you see a tax collector in the Bible, somewhere within a verse or two, it talks about tax collectors and other sinners. They're always tied in together. Because these tax collectors were basically taking advantage of their own people. And this is, this is who Matthew was. And Matthew, when he goes to the house, who is it that he's got at the house? Other tax collectors and other sinners. These are his friends. These are the people that he's hanging out with. This is the group. You know, people tend to gener uh, 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 come to other people like themselves. But you know what Jesus sees in Matthew? Jesus doesn't see a traitor. Jesus doesn't see this guy that's turned his back on Jerusalem. Jesus doesn't see a cheater. Jesus doesn't see... What Jesus sees is a man with potential. And Jesus says, Matthew, I want you to come and follow me. And folks, wherever we're at, whatever we're doing in this life, however far we have drifted away, no matter where we find ourselves, I want to tell you something. You have potential for Jesus Christ. And He is looking for you. You know, you go over to the book of Acts, and you look over into Acts, the ninth chapter, and you see the story where where the Apostle Paul, before he is known as the Apostle Paul, is a man named Saul. And Saul literally makes a living capturing, killing, and imprisoning Christians. And when Saul comes to a point in his life when Jesus says, I see potential in this guy, even though he's trying to crush the church, I see that I can take him and I can use him because he has something for me. When it comes down to that, what happens is, is that Saul... Saul becomes the Apostle Paul. Now, who wrote an overwhelming number of books in the New Testament except the Apostle Paul? And when you go back and you look at it, the Apostle Paul talks about so often when he says that he is the least of the apostles, that he is one that is abnormally born. He calls himself the chief of sinners. But he says, you know what? Jesus saw potential in me. And folks, Jesus sees potential where we don't often see it in ourselves and where oftentimes other people don't see it in us. Poor Matthew sitting at that tax collector's booth. Poor Matthew, I mean, he took the job. But he's got a lot of enemies in Jerusalem. It's just historically, that's just the way it is. He's got a lot of enemies in Jerusalem, in Judea. But Jesus says, you're the one that I want to come and work for me. We all have a potential to work for Him. George Bernard Shaw, the great writer, was uh, asked one time, he said, if you could be anybody in the world other than yourself, who would you be? Do you know what George Bernard Shaw answered? He said, if I could be anybody in the world other than myself, who would I be? I would be the me that I always knew that I was capable of being, but that I wasn't. I mean, think about that for a second. He said, I would still be me, but I would be the me that I was capable of being even though I wasn't. I didn't do what I should have done. Jesus sees that potential in all of us, but you know what we do? is far too often we just settle where we're at. And I think Matthew was at a place where he just settled. Well, this is just going to be my life. This is what I'm going to do. And Jesus comes along and he says, no, it's not. You're going to do more and you're going to follow me. And Matthew leaves it behind and he gets up and he follows Jesus. Because Jesus knew this is a guy that needs a do-over. This is a guy that needs to start over. This is a guy who is really looking for a place where he can just press the reset button and start again. And what a great apostle Matthew turns out to be. We wouldn't have this book that we just read if it weren't for Matthew. So number one, folks, no matter what we gather up in this world, if we don't have Jesus, we have absolutely nothing. And number two, Jesus always sees great potential in all of us. And we all have it. We just need to tap into it. And number three is the fact that Jesus specializes in the reset button. Jesus specializes in starting over. Folks, what is the, the entire point of the New Testament? 
What's the entire point of the gospel? The entire point of all of it is that man had drifted so far away from God that God said, I have to find a way to get man back to me, and I will send my only son down there to bring him back because they've got so far away. They need a start over. They need a reset button. And this is what Jesus does. This is what He specializes in. And when you go through the Gospels over and over and over again, where do you see Jesus hanging out? He's the Son of God. Do you see Him in the halls of kings and princes? Do you see Him standing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, teaching them and living with them? Do you see Him spending time in Pontius Pilate's hall, the the procurator, the, the, the leader of Judea for the Roman government? Do you see him going to Caesar's palace? Not the one in Vegas. <laughs> Do you see Jesus hanging out with... No. Do you see Jesus with sinners? With adulterers? With murderers? With people who have, who have just messed their life up? That's who he spends all of his time with. When you go through there, He's always with them. Now all of these other people that have it all together, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they're always there on the peripheral, but Jesus is down there in the, in the trenches. Look in your Bibles over to the book of Luke. Look in your Bibles over to the book of Luke. Luke, the seventh chapter. And this is a story that we've read many, many, many times in here, but we're going to read it again this morning. Luke, the seventh chapter. Luke, the seventh chapter, starting in the 36th verse. Because this is one of the greatest start-over stories in the Bible. And Jesus teaches a lesson to the person that needs the do-over. He teaches a lesson to the people that are there witnessing it. And He teaches a lesson to us 2,000 years later. Luke, chapter 7, starting in the 36th verse. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with Him. So He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who is touching him and what kind of a woman that she is. She is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which one will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. So he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, but you did not give me water for my feet. But she wet her feet with her tears wet my feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. You know, that's one of the greatest starting over stories in the Bible. And it's the story of all of us. Folks, we have all drifted away. We've all done our own thing. We've all messed up. We've all made our decisions to do things that go against Him. But when we come back to Him, He promises us the opportunity to start over. And here this woman who has led a sinful life, you read between the lines, she's probably a prostitute. And she comes in and she wets Jesus' feet with her, hair, with her tears and she dries them with her hair and she anoints them with oil that she has. And the religious leader looks and says, if he knew what kind of woman that was, he wouldn't even allow her to touch him. And you notice he says that to himself. He doesn't say it out loud. Scripture says he says it to himself. Don't say something to yourself you don't want Jesus to hear. Because <laughs> Jesus looks at him and says, I have something to tell you. You paid no attention to me, but she came in. She washed my feet with her tears. She anointed them with oil. She dried them with her hair. And her sins are many. That's true. But she loves much. And now she gets to start 
over again. Folks, maybe you're here with us this morning, and you're like Matthew. On the outside, everything may look pretty good. You know, things are stable, things are running along all right. Got friends, everything looks great, but you're missing something on the inside. If you don't have Jesus, folks, you're missing what's really important, because you can have everything, and if you don't have Him, you have nothing. Maybe you think to yourself, I just don't have any potential, I don't have anything to offer, I don't have anything to give. Maybe you've just settled. But Jesus says, now get up and come and follow me. Because He is the master of starting over. He is the reset button. And the whole purpose that we're here, the whole reason that I'm standing up here this morning, the whole reason that we come together is to worship the Creator of the universe. And to spread this word out to the world, you have the chance to start over. You haven't fallen so far, you haven't drifted so far, that He will not take you back. And if you're with us this morning, and you're looking for a spiritual start over, folks, I'm going to tell you what, Jesus will give you a card that you never have to go and refill again. You can swipe it endlessly. And every time you need to start over, you can just swipe it and push the start button and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I messed up, done the wrong thing, and I start over. And the Scripture says He's faithful and He will do that for you. If you haven't made the decision to follow Him, if He has called you to follow Him and you haven't made that decision, I want to encourage you to do so this morning. The Bible tells us that we follow Him and make that decision by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that we confess His name before man, that we repent of our sins and that we be baptized for the remission of those sins. If you haven't taken those steps, I want to encourage you this morning, take those steps. Follow Him. Get up out from the tax collector's booth. Go out. Get your card filled endlessly so that you have a place to come back to Him to hit the reset button. If we can help this morning, we certainly want to be able to do that. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And the purpose of this song is to encourage and invite anyone that's here with us this morning. If we can offer prayer for you today, if we can offer baptism for you today, we certainly want to be able to do that. If we can do anything for you today, all that we ask is that you come to the front while we sing. Let's all stand and sing, please.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so truly thankful for, for another day you've blessed us with here on earth, Father. We thank you so much for, for your church and what she means to us, and thank you so much for the congregation here at Kalisburg. Dear Lord, we, we just hope and pray that each and everything that we've done in this place this morning is pleasing and uplifting to you, Father, and just just help us to, to take Ben's message and apply it to our lives throughout the week, Father, and remember that, that you are our only true saving grace, dear Lord. And for those that, that don't know you, Father, help them to come to you before the day of judgment, dear Lord, and help us as, as Christians to encourage them as any way we can see fit. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the answered prayers. It's, it's such a true and joyful time, dear Lord. There's many others here in our congregation that, that, that need your help, dear Lord. Just, just help them to, to look for you for guidance and comfort and, and help us as fellow members to encourage them is any way we see fit. Father, just continue to go with us throughout the week and help us all to be shining examples for you. And when we fail you, we just beg for your forgiveness. This is in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.